Okay, today's going to be a little different from yesterday. Yesterday was fun. I mean, this was just showing how you can play with stuff and get results that you don't expect. This is something that some of you may, part of this, you may have heard some of this because this is not right. No, the other one. As I was about to say, some of you may have heard part of this at the uh, MMT conference uh, in, when was that, September? I think it was September. Okay. But this is going to be a little bit, a little, I'll try to make it a little bit more extensive and mm -hmm. to get down a little closer to the, to the ground that we're working on here. Uh, what we're really doing is trying to pick up what at one stage was, I believe, the major alternative and the initial approach to definitions of money and banking, in particular banking we're talking about rather than, rather than money. Uh, Okay, the problem is this is not the right PowerPoint. But oh, is it? It doesn't make any difference. We'll, we'll, <laughs> live, we'll live with this one. Okay? Because the, the second one I did was, was I think, a little bit different from this one. Okay, so we go back uh, to some key principles. First one, if you look at Schumpeter. Schumpeter talks about a credit theory of money. Okay? And remember we talked Schumpeter about yesterday about Schumpeter being the guy who sort of was at the heart of this German approach of saying that the banking system really can create all the purchasing power that it wants. This is a bit amusing because if you look at Keynes, Keynes took you know, great pains in order to prove that investment was not constrained by saving. And Schumpeter said, well, you know, just look at the banks. As long as the banks can create money, then they can lend to businesses to invest, and therefore, as long as banks are not constrained by saving, then savings cannot be a constraint on investment. And if you read any of these authors in the, uh, starting in sort of 19, 1901, 1902, 1903, they just took it as given that it made no sense to talk about a model in which savings was determined by investment. Uh, even Hayek, who eventually tried to impose the idea that banks should limit their lending to voluntary savings, agreed that this was something that you had to impose on the system. It wasn't a natural, uh, it wasn't a natural property. Okay, so if we look at Schumpeter, I pulled out one of the uh, quotations which I think is the most representative. It may be more useful to start from capitalist finance as a clearing system that cancels claims and debts and carries forward the differences so that money payments come in only as a special case without any particularly fundamental importance. Okay? I don't know. If you read this, you wonder how many people read this and it just went right over the top. You know, okay, Schumpeter, what is this guy smoking? Uh, now we say this: the system basically it can run without money. Money is is more or less irrelevant. Okay. In other words, practically and analytically, a credit theory of money is possibly preferable to a monetary theory of credit. Okay. So what's he say? Monetary theory of credit. Well, if you remember this old idea that deposits create loans and all of that business. Well, Schumpeter had this all straightened out much, much before, this is a quotation from, uh, uh, from the economic analysis book, the history of economic thought, 
book, but it also appears in a 1912 essay, it appears in his uh, subsequently published uh, treatise on money book, it's you know, basic, basic principle. Now that's the first bit of it, and then you go to the second. In other words, practically and analytically, a credit theory of money is possibly preferable. Okay, so we say, okay, we should start from credit. Now, starting from credit, what does he mean? That was the point. We're going to have to go ahead. But the beginning part, after you've gotten yourself past this idea, as he's saying, you know, money is really not important, you go back and you go clearing system. Okay, the clearing system. What is this clearing system? Clearing system. Money is what? Money is just a series of debts and credits. And we know that Schumpeter has been accused of being a sociologist or a sociolo sociological economist, and he talks about money being a social relation. What, is, what does that mean? I mean? There are all sorts of economists who talk about money being a social relationship. Well, for Schumpeter, that social relationship was the fact that, as we'll see, I hope, in a subsequent quotation, if it's still in this version, uh, the subsequent quotation says that basically society is organized in a way in which all of the transactions that you make are recorded in a big balance sheet. And you have a series of debits, and you have a series of credits, and that balance sheet is what represents the social relationships. And money is what? Well, he says money is really unnecessary for that, and it's only required if we need, what does he say, some a special case? Uh, they come in when you have the necessity of clearing these balances outside or in another balance sheet. So Schumpeter is very clear of the idea money is what? Money is a balance sheet. Money is a clearinghouse. And we'll see in, you know, in a minute that clearinghouses were the dominant form of banking. Uh, Keynes in the banking principle, 1940s clearing union. Well, obviously this was based on what Keynes called the banking principle. If you read the uh, clearing, proposal for the clearing union, he talks, he says, well, this is nothing different than the banking principle. Okay, has anybody said, well, what is, what is this banking principle? What is that? Has he ever, you know, up until that point, he's really never talked about the banking principle. But he says, well, this is something that everybody knows of, everybody accepts, everybody knows about the banking principle. What is it? Well, it is what? The necessary equality of debits and credits, of assets and liabilities. Okay? If no credits can be removed outside the banking system, but only transferred within it, the bank itself can never be in difficulties. Now, this is the same thing as Schumpeter saying you never need money, because if all debits and credits balance, all you have to do is to match them up. Nobody needs anything, money thing, to make a payment. Okay? You don't need money. It can be safe. It can, with safety, make what advances it wishes to any of the customers, with the assurance that the proceeds can only be transferred to the bank account of another customer. Its problem is solely to see that its customers behave themselves and the advances made to each of them are prudent and advisable from the point of view of its customers as a whole. Due diligence. Okay, the loan officer has to do credit verification. Okay, you have to make sure that debits are really debits and credits are really credits, and that's it. It's the only kinds of regulation you need in order to make this to make this system make this system work. Now, Keynes in the treatise on money does give us a finally a definition of money. Okay? And the presumption is that this is what he had in mind when he was talking about that banking principle, the debits and credits. So he says, money is what? That by the delivery of which debt contracts and price contracts are discharged, derives its character from its relationship to the money of accounts and the debt and prices must first have been expressed in terms of the latter. Okay, this money of account, where did that come? What is it? Well, people make a lot of big deal out of the money of the account, but you're an accountant. Okay, if you're an accountant, you have a balance sheet, you have debits and credits. What is the first problem that you've got? To resolve. The debits and credits have to be represented in terms of a unit of account. Okay, You can't run a balance sheet without a unit of account. You can't do debits and credits without a unit of account. 
Okay? So the second, if you like, the second piece of this approach is first, it's a clearing mechanism, a balance sheet in which you match debits and credits, and those debits and credits have to be denominated in something, and that something has to be uniform for all the debts and all the credits. So it says it's money of account, this is what allows you to distinguish contracts and so forth. Acknowledgements of debt are themselves a serviceable substitute for money proper in the settlement of transactions. Well, Keynes here is a little behind Schumpeter because he's still talking about a money proper, a money thing. And he's obsessed now by this fact that you don't need the money thing in order to make these payments. Okay? You can go back to Ricardo and Jevons. Okay? And in both of them, you find them going, gosh, we have this problem of money and, or sorry, of gold and whether we use gold as backing or whether we do use gold bars as backing, everything else. And then there are these little asides in which they say, but you know, if we look at London, the banks all make their payments and settle their transactions without using gold, without using anything. And they talk about this as, as being this innovation in the, in the banking system. The fact that you don't need money, actual money, to, in, to do this. So in fact, here, what Keynes is saying, he's saying, OK, when these acknowledgments of debts are used in this way, we may call them bank money, an acknowledgment of, the, of a private debt expressed in the money of account. So then he goes on and he says, we have side by side state money, or money proper, and bank money, or acknowledgments of debt. So I'm saying, OK, we have these two things that exist at the same time. And they exist more or less, and what I'm going to argue is that they exist separately. Okay? Now, if you remember this famous pyramid of money, okay, ain't no pyramid here. Okay? They exist side by side. They're separate. They're two different things. They're two different mechanisms that work. One is the private mechanism of bank money, and the other one is what he calls money proper, what eventually becomes, uh, uh, becomes state money. Schumpeter, again. You remember the state money thing? There's a big deal that Knapp discovers this state money thing. And, okay. Schumpeter and Knapp were contemporaries. Schumpeter thought Knapp was an idiot. Why? Because he didn't understand that money was a social convention. Knapp thought it was a legal convention. Okay? So the two of them did not get along. They argued with each other. This is from a 1912 piece, if I remember. Let's find out where it, where it is now. He says, OK, there is a conflict which has split the German workers in this monetary field and which has no analogy in the lit literature of other nations, like the Brits. Because in the US, we'll see that it's only coming later. Namely, the conflict between the supporters and the opponents of Nap. The view that we are dealing here with two standpoints which differ toto cairo, which led to completely different results and are irreconcilable, is as superficial as is the belief that the ideas involved are of a novelty which places them beyond and completely interrupts all doctrinal development. There are indeed some supporters of the state theory with whose opponents one can but agree in declining even the discussion. But this does not apply either to the basic idea or to the author of the theory or to the best representatives of similar ideas. Our good friend here, Ben Dixon, okay, who was probably the first clear critic of the traditional approach to money as being a token symbol representative of some commodity. It's interesting, if you look at Ben Dixon, okay, if those of you who are familiar with Clower's uh, piece in the Little Penguin Money Book, where he gives the standard Milton Friedman story about people having trouble exchanging and finding coincidence and wants, and then finding some particular thing which serves better than something else in order to be money and everything else. He criticizes this down to the last comma, okay? Beginning of the 1900s, okay? He's already done this, and this is why I say this is uh, the thing we do with this monetarist business has or was already settled by these guys. But the important thing that I want to do here is to say, 
Schumpeter and Knapp were both, you know, they worked at the same time. They recognized it was a different thing. What was the different thing? What I'm going to argue is the different thing is that Schumpeter was looking this at a private banking phenomenon, and Knapp was looking it at a state phenomenon, okay? Government phenomenon. One was legal, yes, the other was social. They were separate, and this is Keynes' side-by-side -side business, okay? Now, Schumpeter's argument is that the private part came first, and it was only Knapp that eventually discovered that governments had recognized the mechanism of using clearing accounts uh, for monetary. Uh, okay. Here we go. Nap, well, we won't go to the, uh, this is Ben Dixon, okay? And again, you see, what is Ben Dixon doing? Nap, okay? All these guys were very obsessed with what Nap was doing because they, were, they thought, thought that Nap was taking the fire away from them, that this was a legal proposition. And they were very concerned. They said, no, this is not legal. It's not that the government comes in and imposes this. These are things that naturally occur in the economic system as banking, as banking develops. So, again, Schumpeter, current account balances, money represented, well, this is the quotation which I thought was, might have disappeared, but it's now, it is here. Money represented by the current account relation, the idea that everyone's economic act is reported on a real or imaginary current account. Each service, whether it consists in money, money claims or goods and services, charged in money is to be credited to each person's current account, while every receipt of money, money claims, goods, services is to be charged to it. The role of the unit of account is to permit the operation of an account settlement system under the individual decision-making characteristic of capitalism. Okay? Now, this comes from the money book, which he eventually published. In the money book, there are chapters on separate balances, current account balances. And there's also one on the socialist economy, in which he says the socialist economy and the capitalist economy are exactly the same, okay? It's just that the unit of account is different, okay? In the unit of account, you're using, talks about labor hours. He says, how do you distribute your labor hours? And he tells the story of, you work, you go to work, you get a certain number of labor credits, and after everything has been produced, then the central planner tells you your labor credits are worth so much in terms of output. He says it's very interesting that the labor credits that you put in may not be the same as the labor credits you get out, okay? Because you've got a central planner that fixes this. When he gets to the capitalist economy, he says exactly the same thing happens, okay? You go to work, but instead of getting a unit of account in terms of labor hours, you get a unit of account in terms of, well, he says it could be anything, but it's what we call money, but it's not really money because nobody in fact holds it, nobody has it. You just get your credits in terms of unit of account and you go and you spend those units of account. And what the system does, what the monetary system does, is a social redistribution of what you put in relative to what you get out, okay? And what you get out may, be, may not have the same value in terms of unit of account, but that's what the market does do. That's what the capitalist system does. So, you know, you may be working a whole lot and you're producing a whole bunch of stuff, but by the time you get to the market, you can hardly keep yourself alive, okay? But that occurs how? That occurs because of the way the system sets the prices on those on those units of account, okay? Now, so this is sort of the basic idea that is behind all of these things. And just to make it a little bit more simple, okay, before we go into the historical business, we do a quick example, okay? When I do this with students, what we do is we say, okay, we're all now part of the same society, okay? We all have relationships of exchange or production with each other, okay? And we all record those relationships in terms of a unit of account on a big balance sheet, okay? So, if Matt sells something to Andres, what happens? Matt comes to me and says, look, 
I now have a credit with Andres. Andres now has a debit with Matt. And I write these down on my balance sheet. Okay? For those of you who are interested, John Hicks almost figured this out. But he didn't quite get it. If you think about his week, and he talks about at the end of the week, you do the settlements. Well, it's close to that, but he, he didn't quite make it. Okay, so what happens? So everybody trades with each other. I write everything down. Okay. By the law of accounts, all the debits match all the credits. Okay? The unit of account is always good. Okay? There's no inflation or deflation of the unit of account. The unit of account can't go bad. Okay? Can't say that bank fails. Because all of these things have a counterpart. Okay? So every credit has a debit. It goes back and forth. They have to balance. Okay? But there's never any problem. Okay? Perfectly stable exchange system. And it's stable in terms of value. Remember, Kate says that the thing that I have to do as the account keeper is not only keep the accounts, I have to make sure that Matt actually gave something to us. Okay? That this is a, an effective transaction. Right? But at any point in time, my books always balance. Okay? Now, that's the good part of it. What's the bad part? The bad part is that I'm running the book. <coughs> now, Matt's got a bunch of stuff that I want. I've got nothing. Okay? So what do I do? I say, okay, Matt, I'm going to give you a credit in the books. You give me the stuff. Now I got your stuff, but the books don't balance anymore. Okay? They don't balance anymore. Yes, they still balance, but they don't balance in terms of having effective transactions. I've created a fictitious credit in the system. And I can do that because I run the book. Okay? And this is the basic problem with the clearing system, is when the guys who are running the system okay, decide to play in the system. Okay? Now, if you think of this in terms of, well, you can try Walras's idea the stock market. Okay? The stock market has what? The stock market has the auctioneer. The auctioneer does not participate in the formation of prices. If he does, what happens? Okay? Prices are no longer equilibrium prices. Same thing with our little clearing mechanism. As long as the guy who is running the clearing stays out of it, it's perfectly stable, it never defaults, okay? and the value of the unit of remains perfectly stable. Never has a problem. When the guy running the account starts fiddling around, then you have difficulties. Okay? And basically the story that I'm now going to tell you is that historically, financial systems and banking in particular evolves from a clearing mechanism, the one that Schumpeter described, to one in which the guys who were running the clearing started to participate. They okay? started to, in fact, interfere. And once they started interfering, creating their own credits, it disturbed the stability of the system, it created fragility in the system, and the difficulties that we now face in terms of okay? <coughs> Historical precedent. This is, these come from two uh, medieval historians, Usher, who was a professor of history at, uh, economic history at Harvard, the Rover, who, gosh, I don't know where he was, he was just an expert, expert in medieval banking. He was at Yale. Okay, banking only begins only when loans are made in bank credit. The banker merely guaranteed payment, okay? Saying, so, okay, banks start out by guaranteeing, they don't participate. Florentine bankers' clearing system. In order to pay by transfer, it was not necessary for the assignor and the assignee to have their bank accounts in the same bank, since all the local banks were in account with each other. It was easy enough to transfer credit from the account of Mr. A, customer of banker X, to the account of Mr. B, customer of banker Y. Okay. Now, in these medieval banks, OK, 
okay? These, in fact, they call these bankers, but they were really what in the European tradition we call notaries, okay? And notaries did what? Notaries verified things, okay? If you think back and you say, well, we have a private property capitalist system, okay? What is private property? Well, obviously private property is something you own. How do you prove that you own something? Okay, where does your ownership come from? Okay. The proof of ownership is the prerequisite for having a market exchange. Why? Well, we're trading two things back and forth. Okay, I've got some land, Matt has got a horse, we're trading horse for land. Okay, Matt gets the land, I get the horse. Normally, what would we have done? We would have gone to the notary, and the notary would say, I affirm that Matt actually owns what he's selling, and the notary says that I, in fact, own what I'm selling. Okay, why? Because all of these things have been previously recorded at one stage in the notary's books. Right? And secondly, that if it turns out that that horse is stolen, okay, you have recourse. You can go back and you can say, look, now that horse was stolen, I want it back. Because it's mine. So, I can't remember, I sold you the horse, right? Or you sold me the horse. Uh, I got the land and you got the horse. I got the horse, okay? So the guy who owns the horse can come to me and say, it's my horse. And he can take it back. Now, now I'm out the land and I'm out the horse. Okay? So without the notary, that's what the notary was there for. To say to the guy, look, if you think it's your horse, go to the notary and prove it to me. Okay? Now we hear a lot about blockchain and all of this bullshit. Mm -hmm. Now what did I just describe? <laughs> It's a blockchain. Okay, it's the verification of the transaction. So I can go to the guy and say, no. Do you know what is the definition of currency? Okay, we do this business. Currency is what? Well, we always say currency is you know, this stuff. No, currency is a legal definition. And currency is the thing that you can use to make a payment without recourse. Okay? So if we're changing land against something, instead of the horse, if there's a problem with the horse, I can say, okay, Matt, I can give you something that is called currency. And that currency says, nobody can come and say it was stolen. Okay? Legal definition. It's the thing which seals a contract. There is no recourse against that contract. So, I mean, the state is behind it. It eventually becomes a decision, okay, of the state to adjudicate disputes that go beyond the, on the notary. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is the definition of currency eventually got quite large, okay? It wasn't money, okay? It was a series of things that were defined by law that could be used in order to seal transactions or, in fact, to discharge debts. Okay? I'm discharging a debt, I'm giving you the horse, you're saying, no, no, I'm not easy with that horse. I'm not sure that the chain is just right on the horse. So I say, okay, I'll give you a claim on the Duke of Medici. Okay, claims on the Duke of Medici, fine, that's currency. Nobody can go back on those because he owns the whole town. Okay? That's the way the, way the system works. Okay? So, this is where this procedure gets set up because all things that were exchanged were in fact recorded by the notaries so the notaries eventually became what? They became the bookkeepers because they had all of the property that was in fact uh, that was subject to exchange. Now the important point here is that the second transaction the Fiorentine bankers man, they could you know they could even swap amongst themselves. One banker could say, okay, you're going to got an account with B, you got an account with A, we'll swap those transactions back and forth. This is the first bank, effectively bank clearinghouses. And this is the Florentine one, I think it's 1400 something, okay? Now, the important thing to look at here is that for this system, 
No paper, no receipts, no nothing, okay? No physical stuff, no gold. Basically, the argument that Ben Dixon, ben Dixon used against the, what he calls the traditional monetary approach was that you could find systems in which gold did not play any role as a means of payment. So he said, if that's the case, then by definition it can't be a general explanation if there are others. And these were the others. If you look at them, there are a lot of them. Okay, so receipts for credits were not customary because the books of the bank were always public and authentic records. Okay, this is the other thing. The rules that, and again, you say that legal, the legal representation here is the legal representation that was imposed by the notaries. Okay, it wasn't necessarily the state which said, which said this, it's the notaries who said this. Okay, the, notary, the notaries produced the regulations themselves, what, were, what we are willing or not willing to accept. And they were public records. Anybody could go in and look, which was the important part of it. If you look, there's still a part of French law, it's until about 10 years ago, required all books to be kept in a ledger in which the accounts were written. And not only that, that you had to have a seal that sealed the last page of the ledger book that was being filled up with the next page of the ledger book that was currently being opened. Mm. Why? Well, now we know that Bitcoin gets hacked a lot. Well, you can hack a ledger, okay? If you can pull a sheet out of the ledger book or you can stick a sheet into the ledger book, you can hack the transaction chain, okay? I can impose my ownership by introducing something into this chain, okay? Now, both Usher and DeRover note the use of client accounts, but the absence of checks or the issue of any liability by the banker in form of a receipt or even evidence of credit. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important for two reasons. First, there's no physical thing, okay? Remember, this was Schumpeter's idea. We don't need money in order to make this thing work. That's the first part of it. And this goes to the argument of people who say, well, it was the... Uh, it was the goldsmith's receipts that eventually became, became money. No, there are no goldsmith's receipts here. This was a perfectly common, uh, perfectly common thing. The other is that the absence of checks or any liability by the banker in the form of evidence means that effectively the, the unit of account was what was the definition of money. What was money? Money was the unit of account. And it was no, not physical. No, no physical representation, necessary physical representation of that of that unit of account. Okay? Now, I, well, I've already talked about this business of clearing could create credit, and it's interesting that, in fact, Usher notes that it was possible for the notaries, he calls bankers, to uh, use what he calls modern overdraft. Loan was created by transfers and withdrawals from the ledger account in excess of the credit. In fact, they would, they would have frequently and occasionally intervene. Now, that we've gotten to unit of account, we get to Luigi Analdi, former president of Italy, well-known let me say conservative economist. Okay. He wrote a paper on what was called imaginary money, which most people never understood, and most people have never read, and most people probably never will read. Okay. You read his paper, and he says, because he was a, basically an economic historian, he said, if you look in Italian history, you find references to money that doesn't exist. Okay. Now, what did he mean, reference of money that doesn't exist? He meant references to coins okay, that have been called money but did not exist. Gosh, that's a little freaky, isn't it? And why didn't they exist? Because they never existed. Okay. Sorry, I sort of said that you couldn't find. You couldn't find them because they never existed. They were what? 
They were units of account. Okay? They existed in all the transaction records that you could find historically, but you couldn't find the coins, and the coins were not there. In fact, what I now eventually discovered was that for all exchange that took place, exchange always took place in terms of an abstract unit of account, and, and here comes the state, but that was, was the prince. In this case, usually it was Austria, because Austria ran that part of Italy for a while. The state would publish okay, lists of exchange rates, not between coins and other coins, but between the coins and the unit of account. Okay? So you could say, okay, we know that all of our contracts, remember Keynes, the unit of account in which allows us to write contracts to settle debts and credits? In fact, all contracts were written in terms of a unit of account, and the problem was, how do I settle if there is an imbalance between the debits and the credits. Remember we said as long as we're just you know, playing amongst ourselves here, we don't need any physical thing in order to make our little economy of transactions work. Okay? If you've got somebody outside the system, okay, you have to settle. So how do you settle if there's an imbalance in debits and credits between trading systems? Well, then you've got to go and get this list. And the list says that you can use a ducat from Milan, you can use a, uh, a gilder from Holland, or you can use this. And I will tell you how many of these things you have to use in order to produce an equivalent of the unit of account, which is what you owe. Okay? You don't owe the physical pieces of gold, or silver, or bronze, or whatever it happens to be. What you owe is your debt denominated in unit of account. But you're going to settle that debt by procuring one of these physical things. Now, why do you have to get that physical thing? Because you don't have a credit anyplace else in the system. That's the only time that you have to do that. Because if you have someplace in the system a credit, okay, Matt and Andres, if I've got a credit from Andres here, I can always use that to pay Matt. I don't need to go out and get a coin. I don't need to look at the table. It tells me what physical coins I can use. Okay? So this is the next step in the argument that uh, Schumpeter and Ben Dixon are using, saying that, in fact, all we're doing is referring to an historical system that actually existed, and people didn't need the little pieces of money. Okay, now you might ask, what were those little pieces of money for? Well, okay, that's, remember, side by side? That's the other side. That was the, you know, the princes, in fact, did use these things, okay? But we don't need them. The bankers don't need them in order to run our clearinghouse. In fact, we could use technically anything in order to do this settlement, okay? You just did the, the, the tables were in terms of, in terms of coins. You can go back into other systems and they use other things. Okay? We all know the apocryphal stories about these tribes that you know, they use stones at the bottom of the sea or they use cowrie shells. Or they use, now, it doesn't make any difference what you're using. The point is that those physical things are not money. They're not things that actually discharge payments. What they simply are, are ways in which you represent the closure of the debt without having a credit inside of that, uh, inside of your clearing system. Okay? So, the notion of unit of account uses a basis of determination of prices and thus is the basis of market exchange and financial practices as late as the 17th and 18th century. Okay, second point, we need the unit of account in order to make our payments, but even before that, okay, we need the unit of account to do what? We need the unit of account to have the concept of price. Okay? I did uh, a paper for the Fag Foster conference about 10 years ago, where I talked about this business of unity and diversity. 
using an argument that comes from Petty, which has been expanded by Alessandro Roncaglia, in which he says, well, even in order to conceive of a thing called a commodity, okay, we have to have some mechanism of making diverse commodities uniform. Okay? You think of wheat. Okay? Wheat is wheat, except there are 27 different kinds of wheat. You go to the, well, you know, the exchange is not here anymore, so you can't do that. But it used to be if you went to the wheat exchange, you know, you have winter wheat, you have summer wheat, you have number 27, you have red, you have blue, you have pink, you have banana, whatever. Okay, they're all wheat. Okay? But how do you decide that they're wheat? Well, you decide that they're wheat because they're in the wheat market. Okay, how are they in the wheat market? Well, they're all traded more or less in the same thing, and certain of them all have uniform prices. Okay? So, if you're thinking of an exchange system, again, we said the first problem we had was to make sure that you own the stuff that's being exchanged. The second, if you're going to have a market, and you're going to have a market in which you can compare this wheat against that wheat, or this product against that product, you have to have a process of uniformity to agree what is a commodity, and then you have to have a mechanism of pricing. Okay? So, Fred in Kansas wants to sell his wheat, and Joe in South Dakota wants to sell his wheat. Now, if Fred is using Kansas money, and Joe is using South Dakota money, okay, and I'm looking at competition in the market in order to find the cheapest wheat to buy, I'm in trouble. Because I have no idea which one is going to be cheapest because I have no way of comparing the prices. So obviously there can't be any market. Okay? Because there is no competition. If there's no competition, there's no market, there's no convergence of market prices to equilibrium. So, what Einaudi is telling us here is the very conception of prices in a market requires uniform units of account. This is the other thing that the unit of account did for you. Okay? It provided the possibility of evaluating debts and credits, but it also provided the evaluation of the particular commodities which are going to be subject to those debts and credits. So, as I say, this is probably one of the most important papers in economics because it shows you the importance of the unit of account in providing or solving that problem of diversity and uniformity. Because without uniformity, we're dead. Okay? There's no theory of competition, there are no markets, there's no incentives, there's nothing. Okay? If you can't compare stuff. How do you compare stuff? Well, you have to have a common, a common unit. And this is going to be the, the unit of account. Now, Colwell is an American economist. Okay, remember Schumpeter was sort of say, not impressed by the economists in the United States, or even those in Britain for that matter. Colwell is an American, 1850 something, 1840, 1850, wrote a massive book on the means of payment. Okay? Again, a book which you've probably never heard of and nobody has ever read except me and right, there's one guy in Washington. Colwell <laughs> Free. Okay? What are bankers? And this now is becomes the crucial representation of this. Bankers are what? A class of men is formed to make it their business to deal in evidences of debt. If a banker or broker purchases the two notes given by the merchant and his customer, it is obvious that both receive the means from him to pay the notes of which he has become holder and owner. Okay? Remember this business of Schumpeter saying the bankers only guarantee? The bankers guarantee what? They guarantee that the debts and credits are right. I'm now a banker. Okay, I'm not a notary anymore, I'm not running the clearinghouse anymore. Colwell says, I can call myself a banker. Why? Because I've got mats. I can't remember if you have debits or credits. So I'm getting old. I used to be able to do these stories and remember who it is. Okay, you've got a debt, you've got a credit. I'm buying both of them. Okay, I'm holding both of them. 
And by the fact that I've got both of them, we know that that exchange can take place because I guarantee it. Okay? So, I am now the banker. Okay? It is obvious that both receive the means from me to pay the notes of which he has become the holder and owner. Okay? The process of payment between them will be very simple if the banker merely give each of the two parties credit on his books for the proceeds of the notes purchased to them. Their respective checks on these credits pay off the whole indebtedness. Thus, banks become, in this way, substantially bookkeepers for their customers. Okay, Caldwell didn't have a chair of economic history at Harvard. He was just a guy you know, who worked in the market. He, would, he's a, he, he is, in fact, quite interesting. If you look, I won't go into that. Okay? Thus, banks become a bookkeeper for their customers. The books of the banks furnish thus a mode of adjustment by which the customers are enabled to apply their credits to the payment of their debts. Okay? Now, you remember Binsky's famous idea, everybody can create IOUs, but you can't get them accepted. Well, this is what he's saying. He said, okay, Minsky didn't quite get it right. Why? Because Matt can pay his debts with a credit. It's just that he's got to have me as a banker in between. Okay, you can do it, but you need the banker to do it. No currency can be more suited to pay a man with than that which pay a man with than that which he has <laughs> issued himself. Okay? Sound familiar? We're going to do Innes in a minute. Okay, Innes was a big copycat. <laughs> now, 20th century clearinghouse approach. Keynes and his contemporaries. Okay? This approach did not die. It persisted. Okay? Pottery, currency and credit. A dealer in debts or credits is a banker. He describes how an economy could function without money, solely on the basis of credit. Okay? Von Mises, terrible guy. <laughs> well, he wasn't that terrible. He just didn't like plenty. <laughs> The modern organization of the payment system makes use of institutions of systematically arranging the settlement of claims by offsetting processes. In the clearinghouse, the claims continuously arising between members are subtracted from one another, and only the balances remain for settlement by the transfer of money or fiduciary media. Okay, exactly the same thing that Schumpeter said, right? You only need money if you need to. The use of money is avoided because claims to money are transferred instead of actual money. This process is continued until claim and debt come together, until creditor and debtor, debtor are united in the same person. Then the claim to money is extinguished since nobody can be shown to be his own creditor or his own debtor. Okay, just think about this for a minute. Now this is in the private clearing system. Eventually what we're going to do or eventually what state money is going to do is that this is the argument that we use of why the government doesn't have to borrow in order to spend. But Von Mises had it already. This is 19, what, 1914, 15, something like that. No mystery. Now, we get to Mr. Mitchell Innes, which is in fact his surname. Whole thing. Okay? So you don't go and call him Hey Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> a credit cancels a debt. This is the primitive law of commerce. Okay, it's not only the primitive law of commerce, it's the primitive law of banking, basically. By sale, a credit is acquired, by purchase, a debt is created. Purchases, therefore, are paid for by sales. Okay? A guy called J.B. Say sort of figured this out and went wild with it. The object of commerce is the acquisition of credits. Okay? If I'm in business, what do I try to do? Well, you try to do what any businessman does. He tries to get your money. Okay? But he's telling you, it's not your money that you want, it's your credits that I want. Why do I want your credits? Because I've got debts. Okay? I want Matt's credit because I've got a debt with Andres. I don't care if you've got money or not, I just have to get that credit so that I can use that credit to offset the debt. Okay, a banker is one who centralizes the debts of mankind and cancels them against one another. Banks are the clearinghouse of commerce. The value of credit does not depend on the existence of gold behind it, but on the solvency of the debtor. 
Okay, what did Keynes tell us? Man, the only thing you've got to do, due diligence. You've got to make sure that your guys are not creating fictitious debts. Minsky, banking is, banking is not money lending. To lend a money lender must have money. Fundamental banking activity is accepting, that is guaranteeing that some party is credit worthy. Okay? A bank, by accepting a debt instrument, agrees to make specified payments if the debtor will not or cannot. Such an accepted or endorsed note can then be sold in the open market. A bank loan is equivalent to a bank's buying a note that it has accepted. Okay? Now, Minsky's gone one step further here. He's got the first part of the argument, but the second part is this note business. Okay, where did that come from? Okay? We haven't talked about that before. We said that Usher and DeRober had sworn on a Bible that these guys do not issue pieces of paper. They do not create notes and there's no market for these notes. Where does this come from? Okay. Take the middle quote, Minsky. Demand deposits have exchange value because a multitude of debtors to banks have outstanding debts that can call for the payment of demand deposits to banks. These debtors will work and sell goods or financial instruments to get demand deposits. The exchange value of deposits is determined by the demands of debtors for deposit needed to fulfill their commitments. Okay? Why can banks issue these notes? Okay? They can only issue the notes because we're all part of this same clearing system and you need those notes because they represent a credit that you can use to extinguish a debt. Okay? Now, we always talk about Minsky having this diverse view of banking. Look at Robert Schiller. Okay? Um, for, well, I was going to say unfortunately. I don't know if it's unfortunate or not. It's unfortunate for the students who go to Yale. Yale produces on the web Schiller's banking lectures. Okay? How does Schiller start out his banking lectures? Banks take people's money and invest it, okay? They collect deposits and they lend deposits, okay? Why do they do this? Because people trust the banks. Why do they trust the banks? They trust the banks because the banks know more about the borrowers than the depositors know. Okay? It's an information asymmetry. Now, the fact that banks may in fact collapse, no, that doesn't really come into the story. Okay? We have trust that they won't collapse. Okay? You look at deposit banking of this sort, deposit banking of that sort is probably the riskiest thing that you can have. You're willing to give the bank the money because he knows the more about where he's investing it, but uh, what about the risk of the banks? So Minsky says, no, this is not the way the thing works. The way, the reason we do this, the reason banks can issue those deposits is because, in fact, these deposits are a representative of somebody else's debt in the system. Okay? And banks can only do this because Everybody in the system is part of the same group. This is what he says. It's because other people have debts to the banks, so they're willing to take the liabilities of the banks. Okay? The reason that works is that we're all part of that same system. You can say, well, you know, in the US we had unit banking. Well, what did the Federal Reserve do? First thing after it was created, 1916, created a clearinghouse across banks. Okay? Park clearance of bank checks, which meant that implicitly, although everybody in the world was not part of the same bank's network of payments, across the US, the Federal Reserve imposed through park clearing that every credit or debit of every unit bank that was a member of the Federal Reserve system, in fact, was part of the same clearing mechanism. And this is why you can write a check in Missouri and actually use that for a payment in New York and vice versa. Although you couldn't take your check to New York and use it. Okay? Why? Because it didn't go through the Fed.
Here is a, another Minsky quote. Securitization throws light on the nature of money. Now, securitization, leave it one side. This is a paper he did on securitization. This, I think, is probably his best definition of money. Money is a financial instrument, a debt, that develops out of the financing activity of positions and assets that becomes generally accepted in an economic community as a means of payment for goods and services and as an instrument by which debts are discharged. Okay? The only reason that it serves as a means of payment it's not because it has gold behind it. It's not because we trust the bank. It's not because the bank knows more than we do. It's because it discharges debts. Okay? It is a mechanism by which we arrange the matching of debits and credits through the financial system. Now, it's unpublished. Hmm? That one is unpublished. Yeah, it's on the, it's in the archive. Yeah, uh, it's in fact a handout that he used at mm. Wash at Wash U. Mm. Uh, so the result of all of this is what? Well, everybody is now discovering that loans create deposits. Okay, well, big deal. Loans <laughs> create deposits. I mean, that's not the point here. Everybody knew this. Okay, but, and I won't go through all of this. Uh, the quotation in the middle is from Hartley Withers. Hartley Withers is my hero. Hartley mm. Withers in 1906 wrote the first, the first book, this is even before Schumpeter was writing, in which he pointed out, because Hart Hartley Withers was the uh, financial market correspondent for the precursor to the Financial Times. Okay? Mm. He wrote like a hundred books. Mm. All of them are really fantastic. Why? Because he actually knew how the how the thing works, okay? He talked to bankers. Bankers told him what they were doing, okay? In most cases, the money taken by one bank has been lent by itself to another bank, and that the greater part of the bank's deposits consist not of cash paid in, but of credits borrowed, for every loan makes a deposit, okay? Can it be any clearer than that? Mm. Okay, the guys at the Bank of England three years ago finally figured this out, gosh. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> Bundesbank guys took them another year and a half. Eventually they figured it out. But this is not really the point. Okay. Also, we have Schumpeter here. The real point is what? Well, the real point is, remember we made this, we said this distinction between me as being the external recorder and being the participant mm -hmm. and the beginning of banking, not having uh, having any notes or physical stuff, and then all of a sudden, after Colwell, people started talking about those notes as being means of payment rather than the offset being the means of payment. How did that happen? Okay, what happened? And here, what I'm going to do is argue that there is a distinction between in banking between making payments and means of payment. Okay. Making payments is what? It's a service. Okay? It's a financial service. Okay? Lawyers, notaries, bankers. Okay? They all provide you with services. Okay? They don't, in fact, enter into a transaction. You buy a house, okay? you've got to get a lawyer. What does the lawyer do? He arranges the, con arranges the contract. Okay? He arranges the contract, he looks at the mortgage, and he says, okay, Mortgage is good, contract is good. We do a little title search to make sure. We're going to put them together. Now you've got the debt, you've got the house. Okay? That's a service. And this is what basically bankers do. Okay? So the evolution of the commercial banking system may be viewed as a description of how bankers provide the bookkeeping systems that allows them to provide netting of client assets and liabilities or what is more easily understood as provision of a clearinghouse for debts and credits. What the commercial banker provides is a service. Make payments via provision of a payment system. Okay, it allows Andres and Matt to exchange. Or Sam, you want to exchange here? You can do it. Okay. We'll put you in the book and you're fine. Okay, no money. No physical stuff. I don't give you a piece of gold. I don't give you a piece of paper saying you've got a credit. Simply written down in my books, and my books are public and verifiable. Okay? 
Matt wants to sell something to Sam. He goes and looks and says, look, I've got a credit. And I said, yeah, well, you know, you look sort of dubious. I don't know if I'm going to trust you. Now, well, there you go, you're a hoodie guy. <laughs> Matt goes to the notary, he looks at the book, and he says, okay, there it is, Sam has got a credit, he's good. His credit is good, we can, we can deal, we're fine. So, the problem is that when banks stopped doing that, or put it in a different way, when banks started issuing their own liabilities to serve as means of payment, okay, when they started giving out these credits. Now, you can give out these credits simply as tokens. You can say, okay, I'll, I'm going to make a token which says that you know, Sam has a credit with me. Token, Matt has a debit with me. Okay? And I can allow people to deal in those tokens. Remember, we had Hawtrey talking about people buying and selling these things. Right? First step. Second step is, no, I'm not dumb. Maybe I am, but... No, probably I am, because I'm not rich. If I were smarter, <laughs> what I would soon figure out is that I could create these little notes, which says, oh, hey, Sam has a credit here. And I could go to Matt and say, okay, I'm going to buy your stuff, and I'm going to give you Sam's credit. Matt says, yeah, okay, I'm looking at the book. Yeah, Sam has a credit there. That's fine. It's not the same credit. Now I got your stuff. Mm. Sam's on the book. Really, I'm on the hook. Okay. Soon as the banker starts writing his own little notes, his own credits, the banker is now on the hook. He's now in the game. Or what I'm going to do is to call this the evolution of banks from brokers to principals. Okay. A broker is what? Well, you know, a broker is simply you know you want to buy something, you want to sell something. I put you guys together. I charge you an arm and a leg, and you get to exchange, okay? And we know this is the only way people ever get rich is by charging fees and commissions. And that's what bankers did. That's what the notary did. He charged you, okay? A little bit, but you have the charge. When they stop being mere agents for their clients and become principals issuing their own liabilities, the provision of payment services converges with the creation of bank money and serves as a substitute to money proper, okay? We've already said that we've got this thing over here side by side, this state business. Okay, when the banker starts going into business, he's a principal, okay? He's now basically a dealer. He's no longer a broker, okay? And the dealer, as we say, a dealer takes position. This is what I would say. You know, taking a position, you have to fund a position. How do I fund a position? Well, I have to fund a position by going out and finding somebody who's going to give me the credit to allow me to take that uh, position. But if we look at that evolution from broker agent to principal dealer, this is a little bit of a stretch. I think I'm pushing this one, but let's go for it. This is the idea of going from Schumpeter's circular flow to Schumpeter's financial development based on creative destruction. Okay, you remember Schumpeter's circular flow? Everything goes, you know, he says, everything goes round and round. You repeat everything every day, and it becomes so routine. And he says that, in fact, you really don't even need money. You first read this, and you go, yeah, this is weird, isn't it? Yeah. But that's, this is what he's saying. He says, if you've got a banker in this system, the banker is doing what? Well, he knows that every week, the farmer brings in the wheat to the miller. The miller takes the wheat and grinds it up into flour, and the miller takes the flour to the baker, and the baker bakes the bread, and the bread sells it back to the farmer, and this goes on and on and on. If I'm the banker, what am I doing? I'm simply doing debits and credits back and forth. And the system goes on and on, and nobody worries. Perfectly stable, perfectly nothing, as Schumpeter said. You don't need physical stuff to make that happen. Okay? So this is sort of the benchmark. And the benchmark becomes what? Well, the benchmark comes when you get a disruption in the circular flow. And this disruption in the circular flow comes how? It's when the bankers are able to do what? To create means of payment. It says if the bankers can create means of payment, then the entrepreneur can get that means of payment and 
really screw up the entire system because he's going to replace the miller with somebody else who knows how to grind up wheat much better than he does. You know, he's probably working there on the, with the windmill or the water mill or whatever it is, and these big stones and stuff, and he comes in with this automatic thing, and the whole system goes nuts. But to do that, what has to happen? Well, to do that, you've got to have innovation in the financial system. And then what is that innovation? Well, those innovations were the way in which the banker got himself into the game as a principal. How did he do this? Well, banknotes. Okay. If we look at the development of banking in England, the Bank of England, the great novelty of the Bank of England was what? The creation of Bank of England notes. Okay. Everybody says that about what banks, what do banks do? Well, they issue bank no. That was the first time any bank had issued a note. Tremendous financial innovation. This is how the Bank of England got into the game of creating purchasing power. Okay? Bank deposits. Well, we know deposits got created when the Bank of England tried to get a monopoly on issuing notes, and the country bankers said, hey, I can do this too. I'm just going to make a deposit. But, you know, then we get the credit cards and, you know, keep going. All of these mechanisms by which Schumpeter's circular flow gets disrupted by the bankers, require the bankers moving from being simple brokers to being principals, to being <coughs> dealers, to be a being able to issue their own liability, and that liability then becomes what? It then becomes that physical means of payment that we all call money. Okay? And that's where the confusion comes from. Okay? Because we forget that really this is something that comes out of the clearing function of the banks. And what we think is that the whole system runs about on the creation of these things, or what Keynes called money proper, or bank money. But technically, as Schumpeter says, they grew up side by side. They were separate. You didn't need them to be interrelated. So it's all of these innovations that allow banks to do this, but at the same time, what does this do? It creates the risk of non-payment by the banks. Okay? Because if I'm acting as principal, I'm issuing my own liability, and I'm using that liability to provide Schumpeter's entrepreneur with his purchasing power in order to innovate in the system, what happens if he doesn't make it? Okay? What happens if he fails? What happens if a whole lot of them fail? Then the bank fails. Okay? The bank is no longer perfectly safe simply because all the assets and the liabilities match up. Because now I'm in this game, I'm issuing all sorts of liabilities, and I ain't got nothing to back them up. Or if I do, you know, we start introducing laws to say, oh, banks have to hold reserves. Why do banks have to hold reserves? Banks have to hold reserves because we're worried that the banks are going to run around and create too much of this stuff to take to expose themselves too much to the risk in the system. And then we get this whole business of bank instability and, okay. General principle of financial innovation, okay? I'm creating now my own principles. <laughs> John Henry, you know, you mentioned the, the, uh, the comments thing yesterday. John Henry always complains because he says, when, whenever people talk about me getting it, it's always prestigious. And he says, he just gets it. Mm -hmm. It's never prestigious. So if, you, if he, he's coming back in three or four weeks, you invite him and, and introduce him as having received the prestigious Beverly mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, this is the prestigious general principle of financial innovation. Okay? It's the way in which financial, financial institutions innovate from broker agents to dealer principles. Okay? The result is the increasing risk associated with the expanding issue of own liabilities to finance without proper counterbalancing private liabilities. Commercial banks only differ from this process in that their liabilities serve as liquid means of making payment. And again, why? Minsky told us why. Because they're part of, you're part of their clearinghouse. 
This clearing function of commercial banks evolves from netting of the private sector debts and credits to netting of the individual bank liabilities serving as means of payment via a clearinghouse covering local member banks. You look at the evolution of the U.S. system before the Federal Reserve, it was run by bank clearinghouses. The banks had their own clearinghouses in order to do this. Okay? The New York clearinghouse probably had tougher regulations than existed after the creation of the, the Federal Reserve. But this movement from broker-dealer, okay, we need some examples. Okay? My principle is that the, the innovation comes in this movement from being the broker to being the dealer. We think of foreign exchange. Okay? Foreign exchange, we normally think about as well. I've got a dollar here, and I've got to send this to England in order to get a pound note back again. Well, no, that never happens. Okay? Foreign exchange is dealt with how? Foreign exchange is dealt with in one country. Okay? Bank notes never move. What happens is that the banks take the exporter's credits in sterling, and they go to the importer's debits in sterling, and they simply match them together. Okay? That's how you do foreign exchange. In fact, even under the gold standard, gold hardly ever moved because it was all done by matching debits and credits in the United States of claims on England and vice versa. Okay? Now, what did bankers do? Well, eventually, they recognized, and we're now into the, in the 1800s, that the U.S. exports a whole lot of cotton and other agricultural goods. And it just happens that cotton comes to market more or less at the same time. So you've got a whole bunch of claims on sterling from the cotton exporters that are coming into the market. And obviously this has an impact on the price of sterling. Okay? Dollar price of sterling goes down. At the same time, you've got U.S. exporters. And the U.S. exporters, more or less, sorry, I should have said U.S. importers. The U.S. importers, more or less, have a more balanced set of goods if they're trading back and forth. So their cyclical movements are a little bit different. So if I'm a banker, I can say, I can predict when sterling is going to depreciate relative to the dollar by looking at the calendar also by looking at how much it rained in Georgia and you know, all sorts of agricultural things. And I can see this, you know, it goes up and down. And I go, man, this always happens. It happens every year. Okay? If it had been 300 years earlier, I would have built a pyramid in Mexico. And when the sun hit that point in the pyramid, I would say, okay, sterling is now going to depreciate. So I better call the priest, and we're going to go out and make sure the corn goes into the ground. No, what do I do? I go in, and I, you know, I start buying up these claims. Okay, it's a really cheap now. Okay, and I hold on to them, and I hold on to them until what? Until prices sterling comes back up. What have I done? I've become a principal. I'm now intervening in the market. Hopefully, I'm stabilizing the market. Okay. Now, if I'm a good banker, or if I've got a good priest on my pyramid, okay, I'm stabilizing the market. But I got a bad priest. Bad priest is going to say, "Look, you know that every time the sun comes up and you buy, you have an impact on price. If you buy a whole lot more, you can move the price." And if you move the price, you're going to scare a whole lot of people. And if you move it enough, you're going to scare them enough that they're going to come into the market, and then you can kill them. And now you're creating instability. Okay? Now, once you get the bankers doing that, what happens? Well, if the banker gets it wrong, he's created all the wealth, he's issued all of these liabilities in order to buy up these credits, and he can't. Well, if the thing doesn't work out the way he thinks it's going to work, he can't make good on those credits. And he becomes insolvent. The bank collapses. Right. Better. Interest rate swaps. 
Interest rate swaps started out with what? Interest rates started out with having fixed rate borrowers, floating rate borrowers. Fixed rate borrowers were medium long term, floating rate borrowers were short term. Floating rate borrowers were usually companies that were relatively young without history. Fixed rate borrowers established companies borrowing long term in established markets. Clever banker looked at this and said, well, if I could get fixed rate borrowing for these new companies, I could give them a leg up. Okay? They could borrow more cheaply. Okay? So what do you do? So the banker went out and they found a fixed rate borrower and they found a flexible rate borrower and said, look, you guys can do a deal or I can do a deal for you. I can put you together and you swap your floating rate payments for your fixed rate payments. And then I'm going to give a little kicker to the fixed rate borrower so that the fixed rate borrower now is in fact borrowing at a rate which is lower than the fixed rate on his outstanding bonds and the floating rate borrower is borrowing at a rate which is lower than the market floating rate. Everybody's happy. And they're so happy that what do I do? I, yeah, I take my arm and a leg because I put together the deal. Okay? I'm a dealer. Sorry. I'm a broker. I'm taking my fees and commissions. Everybody is happy. What happens when I run out of fixed rate borrowers? I'm out of business. And then I go, ah, oh, wait a minute. I can take the other side of the deal. Okay? I can take my floating rate borrower and say, look, I can give you fixed rate plus. I don't have anybody on the other side. I'm going to do it. I'm going to warehouse it. I'm going to take responsibility to take that payment until I find a fixed rate borrower who comes in and wants to do a deal. Okay? Now I'm a principal. Okay? And as a result, what do we get? We get an interest rate swap market. An interest rate swap market in which the banks are no longer simply matching two institutions. The banks are now directly intervening and playing in that market. Okay? Before this, where was the risk? Well, the risk was credit risk of the fixed rate borrower and the credit risk of the floating rate borrower. That was it. There were, banks were not involved in this. After the banker becomes a principal, the banker is taking on part of that risk. Okay? And this is part of this principle, and the principle says that financial innovation is always a banker moving from providing a service to becoming a principle, and this always increases the risk in the system and the risk that's borne by the banker. Okay? Remember Colwell, he said, well, as long as we're just matching stuff, it all matches up. No risk, no pain, no nothing. Now we've got a system that innovates, it's helping Schumpeter's entrepreneurs, but it's also creating additional risk in terms of the way we're doing that financing. Okay? Now, remember yesterday we did Minsky's means of payment being safe and secure, and the investment activity being risky. This is why you can't get them apart. Because, in fact, as long as you're providing that means of payment function, you're providing the clearinghouse, eventually the guys providing the clearinghouse are going to themselves be taking part of the risk. Okay? And this is why you get all of these proposals to try to split them apart, but it's so difficult to do it. Because inherently those two things are going together. They're part of the same, part of the same process. So, yeah, this is Minsky on innovation. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if we want to do this, but this is simply the, the summary, which says that basically if we look at the financial system this way, okay, you can think of this private banking system as functioning, why? Well, we, re we can recast this in terms of uh, NAP's terms. Okay? Recast it how? So basically, the banks can provide 
these means of payment, right? These liabilities, people can take them. Why? Because people need them to settle debts in the system. Okay? The only reason that the banks can play this role of principal and issue means of payment is because those means of payment, those liabilities, okay, can be used to extinguish debts in the system. So you've got to have other people having debts in your system. So you can now see why Schumpeter looks at NAP, and NAP is saying what? Well, the state issues state money, why? Because it forces people to have debts in the system. And how does it do this? It does it by levying tax. And you say, oh, well, okay, big deal. Yeah, we already knew that. Okay, the only way the system works is if you've got people in it with debts. That's what allows you to introduce those liabilities. Okay? It's exactly the same thing that Schumpeter describes as private banking, with one particular peculiar difference, and that peculiar difference is what? Okay. That for the bank money, or for the state money, okay, the state can always do this. Okay? The state doesn't go bankrupt because it can always print up its own. The private bank, okay, because it has become a principal, can go bankrupt, it can disappear. So there's a differential constraint on the private relative to the state system. But Schumpeter would say this is, you know, this is rather nothing to do with being legal. It is not the legal system that does this. This is the way all payment systems work. So if the government wants to acquire resources, okay, it can require resources in exactly the same way that I can acquire resources by issuing my own, my own liabilities. As long as we've got somebody else inside. Now the difference is when I do that, I don't have anything. Okay? I have a naked position. Okay? I've got a naked short, if you like, if I, if I write that liability. The government, on the other hand, doesn't have a naked short. Because the government, in fact, can produce the stuff. It's buying the stuff and it's supplying the stuff. Okay? So the other side of the government acquisition is that it's supplying that stuff. So there's, there's always an asset to match that, to match that liability when you're doing it on the government.